quote, no one should be able to patent human DNA. It would be like patenting air or water. Those are the words of CHEO CEO Alex Munter. He says genetic patents are standing in the way of patient treatment. Joining us now for more on the case, here's Richard Gold. He's a professor of intellectual property at McGill University in Montreal, and we're happy to have you in this studio today. Thank you, Steve. Just before we dive deeper into this, why can genes be patented in the first place? Patent offices in the United States about 30 years ago, Canada more like 20 years ago, thought we could. We've, we patent natural products. You can think about uh, insulin, for example, which is completely natural, but it's created in an artificial environment uh, used as a drug. Uh, we patent Taxol, which is also a, a Taxol, the drug used for against breast cancer, which comes from the huh. yew tree. Okay. And we use that for therapeutics. So we've been patenting natural things in an unnatural context for a long time. And so they just extended that to DNA without any court ever saying yes or no, and it had become the practice. And in your view, what's the problem with that? Well, there are a few problems. One is it's different than Taxol, which is taken from a plant and used for human therapeutics, uh, or for something else that's used in a non-natural context. The problem with DNA patents, it's not all DNA patents, an artificial one reconstructed, that's great stuff, mm -hmm. therapeutics. But what they're really patenting is our ability to access a particular patient's health information. And I don't think anybody should be able to patent someone's health information and stop people from gaining access to it. So if they have a new and improved way of doing a task, great. New therapeutic, great. But if it gets in the way of us actually knowing whether you're likely to get a disease or not, that's a problem for the healthcare system. Did I read correctly that you are providing your expertise on this case pro bono to the hospital? Not only am I doing it, uh, but the lawyers who are representing CHEO uh, at Gilbert's uh, in Toronto are doing it pro bono, and that's usually they charge several million dollars for these things, so that's a big, a big thing. And then all the staff at CHEO is doing this on their own time. How so, come? Because they believe passionately in it, as do I. Believe passionately in? In, in fixing this problem. So you are convinced this is a potentially burgeoning problem that hospitals everywhere are going to have to deal with. Right. In the United States, it's especially troubling in Canada because just last year, the U.S. Supreme Court struck down exactly the same type of patents that TIO was going after. So it's kind of strange that in the U.S., people are allowed to access these tests. There's lots of competition. In Canada, we can't do it. And so that's uh, uh, you know, another reason that we, we need to move now. Uh, the other, I guess, the final reason is there's a whole new generation of tests coming up where we're not testing 15, 30 genes at a time, we're testing 5,000. And if those tests are burdened by patents, it's gonna not only slow down uh, the ability to get tests, it's gonna increase the cost, but it will also leave a lot of gaps. And th therefore, Canadian patients will be at a disadvantage compared to those in the United States and elsewhere. So let's deal with this, this issue while it's small before it really explodes and gets bigger. That's it, and that's, and that's why CHEO is doing this now because they see we're months away from this whole new era of genetic testing. What does the patent in this particular case cover? It covers a disease called long QT, which is actually a syndrome. There are several genes that can contribute to it. Uh, I'm not a cardiologist, uh, <laughs> uh, but it's basically an abnormal heart rhythm. And so you probably heard stories of athletes who suddenly die on the field. So a lot of those, or some of those at least, die from this disease. Uh, it's often the first symptom, unfortunately, for, for quite a few people is sudden death. Uh, so having a genetic test would allow us to know this in advance, and it's quite easy to treat uh, through a change of medications, new medications, change of lifestyle. They could live perfectly normal lives. If they're not caught, bad things happen. Exactly. Uh, what's CHEO doing that, in the view of your opponents, is infringing on their patent? Well, we'll see what they actually say in the end, but the patents are quite broadly written. So they say anybody who copies this natural DNA sequence is guilty of patent infringement, and anybody who compares an individual's genetic sequence to the normal one to see if there's a difference is violating the patent. Well, CHEO, I mean, part of the argument is that that's too broad a reading of the patents and they should be read down, but uh, if you take it on the, in the broad sense, then every time you, anybody does a genetic test, they infringe on both of these patents. So if CHEO got that kind of 
specific genetic information of its own volition, it can't tell the patient? So what would happen now is if they came across this information through their own test, mm -hmm. the person who ran the test would never tell the doctor. They would not even tell the doctor about this. And so the doctor, in advising the patient, would not know about it and therefore would not counsel them about uh, doing something about it. And, so, the, and the tester wouldn't tell the doctor because? The patent. They're not allowed the to find out that information, so they just basically black it out. Hmm. Uh, people in Eastern Ontario are well aware of Alex Munter. They uh, remember him from his time in uh, political life, and now he's the chief executive officer of the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario. He was on uh, another program recently and had this to say about all of this. Roll tape, please. Patents are there for, for innovation, for creativity, to reward uh, ingenuity. Uh, what we're talking about uh, with human DNA is naturally occurring a part of your body. Uh, and it would be like uh, patenting uh, air or water. That's our position. Their position, as told to uh, Evan Solomon on the Power and Politics show on uh, CBC News Network, is that it's just like trying to patent air and water. You can't do it. What do you think of that argument? I think when you're trying to explain this concept to the public, it's a very useful analogy. If you ask patent lawyers, they'll cringe, as they'll cringe on anything that's not technically you know, along the lines. I've tried to come up with another analogies. At the US Supreme Court, they were using things like chips in a cookie, breaking a leaf off a plant in the Amazon, uh, carving a baseball bat out of wood. All of these analogies are inaccurate from a technical legal point of view. What they all capture uh, in different forms is Basically, what we're trying to cap get a hold of is something that's completely natural, and the fact that it is natural is what gives it value. That is, most inventions you can imagine improving, right? So if I have a drug, I can always imagine there's a better drug. But if I have a DNA sequence that corresponds to your particular genetic makeup, it's the fact that it's exactly the same as it is in your body that gives it value. If I start playing with it and improving it, it actually decreases its value as a diagnostic tool. So that's one way to look at this, is that it's the fact that it captures the natural information that makes this valuable. Uh, and in that sense, it's kind of like patenting air or water, even though technically, as I said, patent lawyers will cringe. Well, I, I get why that's problematic for you, but let me just, it, it is such a uh, accessible uh, analogy. Exactly. So uh, let me play devil's advocate here and, and just pursue it a bit. Uh, nobody invented air or water. Somebody put a lot of money and research and so on and so forth into figuring out mm -hmm. how to read a gene. Yes. And, and as a result, um, somehow they have to be rewarded for that, don't they? I completely agree. This is just the wrong way. Uh, Dr. Keating, uh, who was the lead researcher, did us all a favor by sequencing this gene. He was funded by the National Institutes of Health, and they should be thanked for having funded this basic research. That's not the question. He should get kudos. He should get promotions. If he finds, you know, if he uses the fact that he discovered this to come up with a drug, he should be able to patent that. If he finds a particular test kit that he wants to put on the market, he should be able to patent that. Nobody disputes that. What we're disputing is Einstein finding E equals MC squared. Great advance for, for science, not patentable. Hmm. Laws of gravity. Fundamental knowledge about the natural world deserve kudos. They just don't deserve patents. Is part of your argument as well that the National Institutes of Health, I, I presume, is a publicly funded institution, and therefore you know, the public, writ large, helped them? That's right. Uh, and, and they help in drug discovery and a whole bunch of other places. Really, the decision is, if you said this would not have happened but for the patent, uh, in this case, that's simply not uh, correct. And in fact, for this whole field, uh, it's basically funded by the public sector. The private sector does other things that are quite important. So in the United States, a patent plays a different role. Some have argued, for example, in the United States, that uh, you need a patent in order to invest in training doctors, in convincing hospitals to use it, in getting insurers to pay for it. But we don't live in the United States. We have a single payer system where the government makes the decisions about what to fund or not. We don't need all of that. So some of the basic arguments about what role a patent plays in this field in the United States simply don't apply in Canada. If, if this is all, I mean, genetics are natural, right? Right. How, how or why would the uh, patent office give you a patent for something that is natural to begin with? Because they take a, a very technical view. 
they don't patent the gene as it exists in your body. They patent it in what the, the, the legal language used is isolated. So what they do is, you know, it's got thousands of different atoms in it. They change a few atoms at either end, so it's not identical to what's in your body. And they said, well, it's different. And that was the basis that patent offices originally granted the patent. The United States Supreme Court last year said, well, that's, that's, you know, that's not the way to go about it. It's basically capturing natural information. That's the better way to think about it. So they did it because they saw DNA not as an information-carrying device, but simply as a molecule like any other molecule. And how long in Canada have we allowed genes to be patented? I don't know when the first patent. Uh, we certainly know they date back to the 1990s. Hmm. Um, possibly before that, but I haven't searched out to find out when the very first one uh, came out. And how does a patent on a gene help promote research in the first place? Well, I don't think it does, which is uh, part of the argument here. In fact, I would consider these patents weeds in, in, in the innovation field. Right? They, de they deter research, I, I, I think. That's right, because the research that we do today involves massive amount of data, different mutations. We know that you know, if I find out you have a mutation at spot X, that's not going to tell me the likelihood of you getting this disease. I also have to know what, how it's interacting with other genes. And the only way I can figure that out is by having access to lots and lots of patient data. What patents do is they give an incentive to whoever the patent holder, whoever's giving the test, to hold on to their information and not share it with anyone. So we get these little, we get the balkanization of this data, and we never, no one can put it together. And therefore, the best tests don't get developed if this happens. By getting rid of these patents, we then encourage competition on the basis of who could figure out how these things fit together, and they can patent that. Well, let me do devil's advocate sure. again. Uh, have your patents, do your tests, just pay us for them. What's wrong with that? Uh, if the industry had started with that, it probably would have been fine. That's not the way they do it. They say, you have to ship it to us, and we get to keep the proprietary data. Ontario okay. hospitals pay millions of dollars for patents, and nobody cares if they paid, you know, they have to pay a few cents if they could do the test at their own site, in their own way, uh, in, in line with the way they want to provide patient care. But what, the way that these companies make their money is by insisting you ship it to them and basically split up. Rather than doing one large test, you have to do one test with one provider, another test with another provider over different genes. That becomes inefficient. So if all they wanted was a few cents per test, we wouldn't be here. They want more than that. They want more than that. Uh, give us a, a kind of a, um, you know, a view from 35,000 feet, as the expression goes here. What do you think the implications are if a geneticist were to find crucial information because they've done the test, maybe associated with a treatable syndrome, but they withhold it from the patient because they've got the patents and you're not entitled to have them? So the geneticist has the patent? Yeah. Uh, no, if the geneticist finds like, crucial information. That someone else has a patent over. Yes. Well, my guess is the patient, the, the geneticist may feel obliged to reveal that information, therefore expose that geneticist and the institution uh, to patent infringement action. If, which is a lawsuit, I guess. Which is a lawsuit. Um, they would probably get in trouble with provincial authorities. If they didn't do it, if they didn't reveal the information, then presumably their college would, would haul them up and said, you're withholding uh, information. That's unethical. They're really the, between a rock and a hard place. And they? that's how they feel about it. So right now, for these tasks, we do ship them to the United States on these small pieces, and, and we're making do. But it, when we get to that, those larger tests that we're expecting, as I said, months, uh, not years from now, uh, then we'll really be in a bind. OK. Lorraine, how am I doing on time? Two minutes? OK, good. In the last two minutes, let's do a what if, what if. Sure. If you're successful yes. and you prevail in whatever legal action is to come, what are the implications of that? If you're not successful and the other side wins, what are the implications of that? Um, yeah, and luckily I'm not the lawyer, so I don't have to deal with, <laughs> with that. Um, the consequences are if Chio wins and the judgment is clear, right? You never know what a judge is going to say. But let's assume the judge does what Chio asks, which is not only answer this question, but give us principles we can apply in the future. It should open up the field because then provincial governments would be willing 
to allow hospitals and refund hospitals to provide the test. Right now, they don't want to be seen as encouraging hospitals to violate patents. But then we'd have a clear basis to say, these patents are no good, go ahead and do the test. So we'd be able to move into that next generation of tests, client, uh, sorry, patient care would go up, and our researchers would be part of the international uh, you know, work to get the bet next best test. Mm -hmm. If we lost, Probably in the end, nothing much will happen because right now people are obeying the patents. They're too f afraid to move forward. And so the difference between wondering whether the patents are valid but not willing to test it and knowing that they're valid is not that great. But what we'll then have is this balkanized world for Canadian patients where we may miss out on the best test. Uh, I don't want to be overly dramatic here if it's not the case, but if you lose, Lives lost, treatment not given. I mean, does it get that dramatic? I hope not. Uh, I hope we find ways to work with uh, the industry to get over this. We may have to wait for the. We, we may be behind the times. Uh, geneticists will try and do their best, but yes, that's that's a theoretical risk. And if you guys win, are there intellectual property implications? Uh, that are significant for the other side, and they may decide, you know what, Canada's not a good place to do business. We don't want to go there. I don't think they'll be any worse than the United States. Remember, the United States decided all these things in exactly the way that Chio wants. So we certainly would not be at a comparative disadvantage to the U.S., uh, depending on how the judge decide the case. One of the reasons we're all doing it pro bono and that I'm bringing an international group of experts is to educate the judge so that the judge's ruling is clear and doesn't go beyond what's necessary to solve this particular problem. It would be a problem if the judge just went off and said, you, know, you can never patent anything that has a natural source. That would be a problem. But we're hoping to educate the judge, and we're sure the other side will as well, to make sure that the, the judgment is sufficiently clear and narrow that that doesn't occur. And what's the timeline on all of this? Oh, it all depends on the parties. Uh, one could expect to get to court in about a year to a year and a half. It could go all the way to Supreme Court, which could take four or five years, depending on how quick or slow the parties are. Stay tuned. Richard Gold, good of you to join us on TVO tonight. Thanks so much for your help on this. Thank you, Steve. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.